Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the Sales Leaders Playbook. Today we welcome Andy Sadler. Andy is the General Manager and Mayor at Imply, an A16Z back startup destined for unicorn. In this episode, we discover the unique journey of a relentless sales guy who is now building the most revered sales team in technology. This is his playbook. edition series of 33 CXOs, we investigate one of the greatest success stories in the history of software sales. 33 CXOs learnt the playbook from one man, John McMahon, a legacy which stretches back to the late 90s at a company called PTC. They were later reunited at Blade Logic, which was acquired by BMC. What happened next was truly remarkable. These CXOs went on to become the most prolific sales leaders in the software industry. They've raised over 22 billion in VC funding. They contribute to 4% of software turnover globally, 26 unicorns, eight decacorns, and the companies they drive have a combined valuation of 230 billion. At Hunters and Unicorn, we're revealing their playbook. And I'm, I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Hey, everyone. And Andy, as I said, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Andy, can you just start off by just telling us a little bit about um, the mission at uh, Imply? Yeah, sure. Good morning, guys. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, it's pretty simple, right? We're, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do everything that we've always tried to do with other software companies at this stage. Um, I typically will join this comp- a company at Imply stage when they've got um, product market fit in the US and they're looking to scale uh, and, uh, and dominate EMEA. And, and that's really what my mission is. Uh, we, we have, a, and this, I will give this one to, uh, to another leader, but we do have a, a mission about creating the most um, revered and feared go-to-market team in EMEA. Um, and I will give that one to John, but there you go. <laughs> I'm curious mm. to understand what that would look like. You know, mm. what, what, what is the, uh, what are the mechanisms <clears throat> that you're kind of looking at Andy to, to, to make that a possibility? Yeah. Uh, when anyone's revered, they're respected. They're, whether that be revered from the customer, revered from the, your colleagues, revered from the competition. Um, people don't uh, hate someone who's very successful. They, 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 they admire them. So to build a, to build a company or a team which is revered is uh, is is amazing. Um, I, I, and the uh, the feared side is is we can go all the way back if you want to uh, to PTC. We we used to write our name in the in the visitors book three or four times the old book because we wanted the competition to walk in and see PTC here. Oh my God, uh, I'm in trouble, right? So. We can't do that anymore, especially with COVID. So um, we have to we have to be uh, be feared due to our our, our, uh, our our amazing results, and and we know that when we're there, we're going to succeed. And also, I, I I I want with all the organisations to get involved in. I want people to say, "Oh wow, he was at Imply." So any of my team, he was at Imply. Uh, he must be brilliant, well trained, uh, and an excellent nice job. Probably a good way to kind of go back actually earlier in your career because, um, you know, today we are obviously talking about the 33 CXOs and, and the kind of whole, the, the amazing success that this special group of individuals have obviously had and the impact they've had. And obviously, Andy, um, you know, you've come from the other side of the pond, from, from kind of the European side, from the UK side. But yet your trajectory has obviously been very, um, very similar in, in, in many respects. Um, but I, I do want to go right to the very beginning of your, uh, of your career. So can you just tell us a little bit about how did you actually end up, you know, getting to that whole kind of PTC blade logic world? You know, tell us what happened before that. Yeah, sure. Um, I used to be a footballer. 
So um, uh, that was my uh, trajectory. I was a um, I was a footballer um, professionally in England. I played wow. for uh, many different clubs. Uh, there's a couple of guys on your uh, on your list who uh, who dispute that. Doug and Dean Norman. <laughs> but um, no, I, I was a footballer. My my, my trajectory was football. I, I signed. Um, I was a YTS footballer. I was a professional footballer. I I was I was uh, on that trajectory, and then I ended up in the states um, uh, playing over there. And then I came back, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and uh, I, I I ended up working uh, for a uh, a company called Ose because I needed I was playing semi professional football at that time, and I just didn't have a job. So I was getting paid to play football at whatever it was, a couple hundred pound a week at that time, and I just needed to get another job. And I ended up working for. Uh, a company called Ose as a uh, uh, in telly sales. Um, that, that's that's how I started, and uh, I was supporting a sales guy. I'll give him a shout out. He's probably changed my life. A guy called Gary Stockton, who never went into software sales, but I was basically um, for about six months, no, five months, sorry, uh, selling paper, and that's that's how I started. Just. Uh, and what happened was Gary left and joined a, a little software company and he rang the MD and said, look, you need to hire this kid. And, uh, and, and I came over and uh, just kind of started selling a product called AutoCAD from there. And it was, uh, it was pretty good. Oh, well, we've heard it that's all that. now. Uh, selling, selling knives, selling paper, <laughs> whatever's going to be next. Hey. Um, we, we, I, I went with guys at PTC who sold staircases, uh, um, wow. stair lifts, and I won't, I won't tell you who that is, but he's a very <laughs> successful guy now. Absolutely love that. And so you joined, so um, from the EDS Corporation, 1997 to 1999. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was your... there was a there was a little there was a little com- couple of companies, small resellers. So now I'm selling CAD, right? AutoCAD, mm-hmm. which was. Uh, which was kind of the 2D CAD system. And um, a friend of mine joined uh, this company called PTC. I, I didn't know who they were. I had no idea. So um, I, 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 I got recruited, not recruited, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. I made a friend with someone at PTC and then they kind of started to recruit me without me realizing I was being recruited. And uh, I ended up uh, going to meet a guy, again, uh, great guy uh, Phil Gripton Phil 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 said you know we want to we want to bring on board so uh so I went through the process and then they got headcount froze so Phil kind of said look you know why don't we why don't you go and join a competitor for a year so I was like cool so uh I I went and joined EDS uh, for a year on almost a a, a recce uh, where I went and understood what PTC, uh, sorry, what one of their competitors did, which was a product called Unigraphics, uh, worked with some actually really cool people there. And then about nine nine months later, um, Phil ran me up and said, right, we're, we're, we're ready. We're, we've got a, an open headcount. So I was like really excited. And, and so I wrote my CV and uh, I flew up to Newcastle and went and met Tom Siegel. Again, another great guy. And uh, I'm, I'm in this... Uh, I'm in this hotel uh, in my suit and, and, and got my CV. And uh, I, I, I think my interview was at three o'clock and, and I saw what I thought was Tom Siegel. So I kind of walked over to him and he was talking to this young guy. And I said, hey, uh, are you Tom Siegel? And he went, who are you? I said, I'm Andy Sadler. He went, go and sit over there. So I was like, okay. So I went and sat over there. And then uh, Tom Siegel was berating this guy, obviously the sales guy. And then Tom Siegel came over to me and... Um, he said, uh, give me your CV. So I gave him my CV and he, and like, he read my CV and he, he, he reads it. He rips it in half, throws it on the floor and says, that's a pile of shit. Get out of my face. Now, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a friend of Tom's now on, on Facebook. And, and, and uh, you know, but uh, I, I, picked the, uh, I picked the CV up and said to him, Tom, I... I I understand you might think it's a piece of shit, but a manager and a regional vice president who worked for you, who you've obviously hired, promoted, and think are great, actually think I'm great. So if you're saying it's a piece of shit, they must be a piece of shit. So he picks it up and says, sit down. And that's 
20 wow. minutes later, you offered me a job. So I ended up in PTC. What a great story. Brilliant. Great and, story. and so you joined PTC in 1999, is that correct? Yeah, Ollie, we're falling out, mate. You're making me sound really old, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was 2009. I do apologise. Um, which was yeah, a year after, which was a year after John McMahon had left the business because he left the business in 1998, right? Um, so I'm assuming that he obviously didn't have any involvement in in, in your hire or no, at look, that stage any involvement. Absolutely zero. Uh, mm. you, you know, um, <clears throat> at that point, um, Cranny uh, Cranny was on his way up in the states, but look. Um, PTC in 99 and 2000, we didn't care about America. We didn't mm. care about next quarter. We didn't care about anything about, the only thing we cared about was keeping our job. So, mm. you know, was I looking over the pond and no, I, I, I didn't give two shits um, at all. Uh, I, I pretty much, the, 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 the environment from going from a footballer and being in the locker room to being, in a, in a, in a PTC sales meeting was no different. Yep. Um, we'd have guys like, uh, hand grenade Hanlin, John Hanlin, who'd come over and, you know, just shout at people and mash la uh, big computer screens. They were at the time. And you were just, you were just afraid of losing your job. So you just kept going. Right. So, um, no, jo look, John's legacy and John and, and definitely Jack Napoli's, you know, involvement and legacy was, was strong. We were moving very, very, very fast, but we didn't care. I'll be honest, we didn't care about the states. So, right, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Andy, there's a quite an interesting story about how you actually first got on PTC's radar, which I think is quite an interesting one, right? Because yeah, <laughs> I don't want to yeah. take it back, but actually, it's uh, I think it's an interesting story to share. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was working for a, um, a PTC reseller. Uh, uh, this is how I originally got on, on Phil's radar. Um, Phil was the sales guy at the time. Phil Gripton was the sales guy. Ho hopefully uh, he, he'll, uh, he'll watch this and remember. Yeah, so th this was obviously uh, pre-webinars, um, pre-Zoom, pre-many, many, many uh, things. And the way that PTC would... Um, the way that PTC would go and generate pipeline in a region is they would go and hire a, 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 a like a like a room or a like, these weren't hotel rooms they were more like community centers or you know and they would go and hire these rooms and they would put a sales guy in there and they put an SE in there and they would they would uh, do demos and they would invite the local companies to do the demos now in my patch, I knew these were going on because people were talking about them and there were flyers and, 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 and stuff like this. So firstly, I wanted to go to these events to learn because I wanted to learn what PTC, you know, I was tr trying to get into this company were doing. So that was my first thought. And then my second thought was, well, I'm reselling this product and why wouldn't I let them go and do all the pipeline generation? I can then go and sell to the customers. So that was my, my, my goal. Um, so, you know, I kind of broke one of my moral codes, I guess, and went in and couldn't get in the room, but saw that book I was talking about with all the names and took the book. Um, Borrowed it. <laughs> yeah. What I'd do is I would take the book and then I would write all the names down in my book. I would then go back in, put the book there, you know, because I wasn't stealing and then, and then I would immediately tailgate the people who came out there and try and sell them my product, which was uh, a product, a pro engineer reseller. The, um, the funny part of that story, Simon, is um, the sales guy obviously would do these events and he would be all excited and he would probably go and have coffee or a beer with his SE and go, wow, tomorrow or the next day, we're going to follow these leads up. And I'd already done it. And um, yeah. So it, it, I did this three times and they were doing it in Blackburn and, and Bolton and, and, and these kind of very northern towns where um, industri industrialization was very compact. So it, it didn't take very long to realize that they were being cracked. And 
the sales guy who was working uh, on, on the patch, um, I never forget, he had a big deal at a company called BNFL, uh, which was a massive pro engineer account. Uh, I probably won't mention the sales guy now because he's a chairman of a, of a uh, of an AIM listed company. Um, but uh, he he uh, he called me up and said, "Hey Andy, can we have a meeting?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." I thought it was about him recruiting me again because you're always being recruited by sales guys this way. So I went and met him at a company in a in a uh, in a restaurant called TGI Fridays in Sale, and um, it was like eight o'clock on a Wednesday night. It was typical Manchester weather. It was raining. It was winter. So I'm waiting at this table thinking this guy's going to come in and, and um, I was driving a little I don't know, golf and then all of a sudden I see this big silver Mercedes coming into the car park. So the PTC reps here in his big Mercedes and I was like, really excited. And then he walks in, big guy, a um, bit older than me and uh, he calls me over and says, can we go outside? And I thought, oh wow. He, the first thing he does is he says, uh, I, I need to ask you, are you bugged? So what do you mean? He goes, You're, you've obviously booked my house or my car or something because I don't understand why everywhere I go, you're already there. And uh, I was like, no, 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 I, I haven't. And then he's, and then, so we, he pats me down, we go down and I tell him what I've been doing. And the, unfortunately, the PTC reseller I worked for lost their license the following day. Wow. So. <laughs> there we go. What a story. What a story, Andy. Um, so fast forwarding a couple of years, you did um, a two year, uh, a three year stint um, at another software company, which then got acquired. Um, and then on to Blade Logic. Reunited. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah excuse me. Um, that other software company you're talking mm. about though, was a PTC company. Right. Okay. Okay, so that was a Jim Vedder company. God, it was unfortunately now uh, passed away, Jim. But that yeah. was that was another PTC company. That that was a whole PTC raft who went to Accentral Software. Yep. Um, with um, Luca Lazaron, um, uh, Jeremy, me, Dave Woodcock, uh, again another PTC guy um, who who uh, who built PTC. So yeah, that was essential. And again, we. Um, we went into that organization and took all of the um, processes and uh, sold it to IBM and then played. And then played reunited third man on the ground in the UK. Yeah. Played. <clears throat> that was interesting. Um, it was interesting because um, when we were at PTC, we were, although we were relative, all, all very, very young, uh, we were, we were pretty big. When I joined PTC, we had a, probably, you know, 2000 sales guys, but I didn't realize because I was only looking at my region, which was eight sales guys in the North and then eight sales guys in the South. So I always felt I'd worked for smaller companies because I repeat, we, uh, we were always, um, we were only ever looking inwards, uh, yeah. at, at our team and who's in our team. And then, um, and then, yeah, you're right. We, we ended up at blade and it was me, uh, Two other guys uh, and, and and Duggan in uh, in a little office in um, near, near Heathrow, and we didn't sell anything for a long time. We, we didn't sell anything for a few months. It was uh, it was very hard. It was uh, it was a very hard, lonely place. The uh, the the continual threat of uh, of not keeping your job was there for a long time. And why was it so challenging, Andy? We um we didn't understand the message. So one of the, one of the great things that we, we, we got at PTC was, was, uh, command of the message. <laughs> so we, we, um, and, 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 it, and it's a really interesting term command of the message because we always, and, and I talk about this a lot with throughout my career and a lot of the things I read, <clears throat> there's a lot of army analogies because the whole thing was structured like an army. Um, you know, we, 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 um, a lot of our terminology is, you know, we, we have battle cards. We don't have competitive Intel. You know, we, um, we have command of the message like you, uh, you know, you have in, in, in those types of environments. And, and, and at Blade, we, we didn't command the message early. So we were, and then when we did command the message, um, we then, we then flew. That's right. the truth. Um, and command the message is is that a John Kaplan? Uh, is that <laughs> right there, or is that a 
yeah, yeah. Look, it, it's 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 a it's a PTC. It's a PTC <laughs> message. Fair yeah. enough. John, 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 for, mm. of course, uh, you know John and, and Grant, oh, brilliant what they've done. Mm. Um, brilliant. Um, com- command of the plan, command of the message, command of the people. Right. Mm. We were we were we were taught that um, as very 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 young leaders at PTC. John's taking it to the next level. Right. So, so Andy, just you know, thinking about you know, being a footballer, being kind of unstructured. You know, you've given us an, a kind of an account where mm-hmm. you're obviously very hungry, willing to go above and beyond, but obviously maybe lacking that kind of structure. As you're kind of transitioning through PTC and then eventually getting to Blade Logic, what kind of changes did you start to see in yourself? And kind of what did you start to pick up with your approach? And how did you adapt yourself during that time? <clears throat> um, I don't know what you mean by lack of structure, by the way, uh, but uh, because unfortunately I'm too structured uh, <laughs> okay. in, in terms of a, a, of a, um, of a personal playbook. Um, I, I think I understand your point, though. Um, look, um, what, one of the biggest challenges that I see across the whole uh, industry is a, is a lack of uh, acknowledgement of change. So even in the four years I was at PTC, the 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 the, the, and the guys and I will say guys, because unfortunately PTC's recruitment strategy was was unbelievably polarized. Um, if they didn't change in that four year period, they were out. And 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 when we went to Blade Logic. Um, the, the, the go-to-market playbook had to change and it's changed in imply and it had to change in, in BMC. And if you don't adapt into that change, you're, you're a dinosaur, right? So um, I think, um, you, you, you know, we, um, we, we get in at PTC at six in the morning and we do as many calls as we could. We'd, we'd go into an, a, a trading estate and we might do a demo in this building. And then we'd literally go knock on the door at this building. We would, we would tell this guy we've got a meeting with that guy and we try and get the two things together. We talk about, you know, we, we, we've got, um, we're trying to piece deals together and there was a lack of information that people couldn't have and therefore you had the power. And part of that transition is that the, the, in the information and data world, all the power is with the buyer now. And, and that transition happened over the period of time. So if you think about it, you know, even early internet and, and so forth, you know, you, you had the power, you had a, you know, you, nobody understood really if you were five times faster than a competitor or if your price book was this or, and, and therefore you were able, you were able to use that power. If you didn't understand throughout that journey that the power shifted and they, they, especially with social networks that they can reference you, they can reference the client, they can do all these things in the background before they even met you. And if you go into that meeting uh, now not prepared, then you, you, you're going to die. So it, throughout that journey, um, that whole change had to occur. Um, I actually don't trans- transcribe to command of the people anymore because um, you, know, you guys are in recruitment, right? People have a lot of choices now, and I think you have to inspire the people. And that's, that's part of a, a, a shift that happened around BMC times. Wow. It'd be really good for us because I know that that uh, kind of BMC was a, was a kind of an important kind of milestone in terms of you developing some of the core foundations of your own playbook, which is around kind of recruitment as a process. Would you be able to kind of tell us a little bit about how that came about and what the kind of core pillars of that are? Sure. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I was, um, I was, I just, I just had my uh, first, first, first kid, right? So you've gone from a twenty, a twenty-five-year-old at PTC who's literally living on fumes and, and you know, uh, doing whatever, whatever was needed to, you know, g- keep keep going, right? Um, you know, getting get, getting promoted and just moving overnight, you know, that type of, you know, just going to live in the Midlands for two weeks because you've got a deal there. So then you've got a kid, right, at BMC, which is you know, starting family and stuff. 
and your perspective slightly changes and you start to really understand uh, what's driving um, and how to motivate and drive, um, shall we say, more mature people who aren't just thinking of each quarter um, and, and how you're going to do that, right? So, um, you know, part, part of that is, is the realisation, and, and this happened at BMC, that um, if we don't, or if I didn't, or we didn't think about um, how, how can we, yes, recruit the right people yes develop the right people and, and, and keep them in the boat um we're, we're going to lose and john you know john talks a lot about that right about the impact of of a bad hire and how long it's going to take you and, and and so forth but if the people you've got in the boat at the time aren't aren't going to make it you've you've got to get rid of them right so one of the things that we learned at bmc that i've never seen before was this concept of, um, and I will try not to swear, okay, uh, fat, lazy, middle-aged, typically male, um, expectant sales guys. I expect to earn because I have been doing this for so long and it's just bullshit. So um, we... Um, there's no surprise that you saw at BMC a huge turnover of existing uh, workforce, sales force, because they were just lazy. So part of, part of that um, <clears throat> playbook was um, under, uh, part of that recruitment as a process was understanding, you know, what we had to do because we'd always worked at PTC. You were very hungry and, they, they hired a certain type of person. And as we went through, we were still trying to keep that. But we actually took quite a lot of the team with us. I, I think I worked with um, five guys for 13 years throughout that process. Wow. Um, to, get to, um, to get to BMC, right? So um, we, 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 we as a team or we as a leadership team understood what was needed. When we get to BMC, you start to realize that shit, and um, there's people who just expect to earn X dollars by just turning up. So that needed a, a, a real change. And um, that, that, that was a big, uh, a big impact. So what were those changes <coughs> that you started to kind of implement? Because, you know, we, we know typically <coughs> what the criteria was like at PTC. It was, um, but how did you adapt that? It's a really good question, right? So it, it's, it's drilled and you guys probably even know the criteria, right? So we had the criteria, which was intelligence, coachability, character, track record. But I, I started to break that down. And even now when I speak to my ex PTCers, they still don't necessarily break it down into the maniacal detail I do because I started to realize the nuances of it are, are very, very important. So, and the, um, if you go back to PTC, I don't care what anyone says, character was number one. We didn't really care if you couldn't add up because your RD was going to be able to add up for you. You had to run through the wall. So character. Coachability was number two because you had to listen and do what you were told. Let's just tell you how it is, right? Um, remember, we're in a command and control um, uh, environment, right? So I will command you and, and do what you will do what I say type thing, right? But do what I do as I do, you know, in a, in a, in a mode that you're not going to ask anyone to do anything you wouldn't do yourself, right? Then we go into uh, track record. So in PTC, we, we always looked for people who had an, an unbelievable track record inside or outside work. I was an ex-footballer. I, I worked with other guys who were ex-footballers, ex-racing drivers, ex-Sandhurst um, very rarely did you get an ex Cambridge first graduate in PTC because that guy was probably going to get beat up. Um, <laughs> so, um, no, we, 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 you know, whether it be you know amazing characters, but very very strong. <clears throat> and then the last one was intelligence, right? And I don't care what anyone says, right? That was the real criteria of PTC. Find the guy who's tough. Find the guy who's got something in his background which is going to make him be be. be resilient and never quit make sure he's coachable and he can take it take direction make make sure that he's done it before and he's got an evidence of that he, that he can excel in something uh, and then make sure he can add up okay 
when I got to BMC, that, that, that you know, we, we were developing it over time. I never forget, I, I, um, I, you know, I went to my GM at the time and said, look, I, I think we should flip this on its head fully, fully flip it on its head and go intelligence number one, track record as the last one. Um, and then we'll still go intelligence, coachability, character. We can interchange those. <clears throat> and then um, got the backing to do that and then built a postgraduate program with um, Imperial College and London School of Economics, where um, built a bridge, um, built a program, which was an awesome program, had a few people run it for me and um, wrote all the content for it. And then went to the business schools, understood how the business school leaders were measured. They're measured on second year income of their postgraduates. So great. I could tell them that I can out uh, perform Barclays, Accenture, all KPMG, Deloitte, all the people who were trying to get these postgraduates. So I've got the business school leaders on my side. They were selling for me. That's champion building. And then, um, and then got through that, started to do internal advertising uh, in the business school. This is a sales campaign, right? And then in the first year, I think we had 300 applicants. We hired 10. They went, they went on a three month, literally in a classroom for three months at BMC. They did 65 exams in that period. And then, um, and, and then we put them in the field um, for three months. And then we promoted them to enterprise sales reps. And we did that pro I did that program for three years. Um, and some of the best, best and i'll give a shout out to one of the one of the guys eric lightfoot now who's uh, flying at bmc but some of the best sales sales guys came on that program but again the criteria track record they've never sold anything before proving that intelligence we could teach them this we could teach yeah. them the playbook interesting and so it's been you know we've been asked this quite a few times by individuals that have really bought into this series and kind of understood why you're hiring under that criteria but how do you assess that so what sort of qualification process will you go to to understand the intelligence the characteristics and the coachability can you give us some of the questions that you may ask an individual in an interview as an example yeah sure um the, the, okay I, I i i don't mind saying because you've got to implement it right so um when you look at intelligence, um, okay, so intelligence is broken down into three areas, okay? We have, uh, we, have <laughs> we have two sides to our brain. We have a left side and a right side, okay? Left side logic, right side emotion, okay? The more intelligence we put in our left brain, uh, the, more, uh, the, 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 the more knowledge we have. We use knowledge when we put under pressure, okay? So knowledge is our kind of go-to... Um, uh, our go-to reaction to something when we know what it is that we're reacting with. Okay. If we don't, if we don't know what we're reacting with, we're going to react with emotion. Emotion is fear or flight, you know, all the normal uh, basic emotion, uh, basic emotions. So if we put someone in a pressurized scenario, the, um, the way they react is going to tell you very quickly whether they know what they're doing or whether it's just an emotional reaction. Because the decision that they make is based on that, that, that chemical reaction in their brain. Does that make sense? So, yeah, completely, so, yeah. So, if, so as a footballer, you train and train and train and train so that when you're doing it in front of a crowd and you're under pressure, you know what you're doing. So when the, because you practice that in the, uh, in the special forces, they call that rapid intuitive, rapid intuitive experience because they train their, their elite soldiers, everything. So they'll suffocate them. They'll bury them alive. They'll waterboard them. They'll 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 do all of these things so that when they're in the field, they 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 know exactly how they're going to react. Okay. So when we take that process into what we do, we train them, train them, train them, so that they understand how to prevent objections. They understand how to, how to uh, how to handle. Um, executive pressure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so when we're interviewing, um, we have to understand the questions, sorry, the answers that we're getting, are they left or right? Okay, why and how did they make that decision? So why, so a typical question I would ask is, you know, what, what was the process you did to get to that point, whatever that point might be? 
if the answer is something like, my, well, my best friend worked there, that's a bit of an emotive answer, right? If they're logical and come up with the, what, what was the process they went through, they're going to apply that process in pretty much most of the other decisions they make. So it's trying to understand how they make that decision. It's going to understand how, how intelligent they are. Now, books behind me and books you know, we, um, no one's the Oracle. So you've got to be continually learning and continually feeding this left side of the brain to make sure that you, you understand. And the best way to do that is by other people who've been through that experience. Um, you know, I, I, I was very influenced by, and I'll give him a shout out on this, on this podcast, Jonathan Farrington, who's a very, very, very experienced sales coach who once said to me, you learn through OPM, other people's mistakes, so that's written in books. So I, I've been a, an avid reader of, of things to try and rectify my mistakes. And also you get rich with other people's money. And, and that's kind of uh, the two OPMs you gave me. So I, I think, um, you know, it's a good, good, good transition to the second, kind of your second pillar of kind of your, your, your kind of the backbone to your playbook, which is development. I know we've obviously spoken about recruitment as a process, but can you tell us a little bit about how you invest, how you nurture, once you've identified the right person, what is it then you continue to do to get them to where they need to get to? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I watched, you know, I watched John's podcast, right? And John's, John's spot on. And obviously I've worked in John's environment for, you know, a long time. Um, you, you don't go into, you don't go into leadership for money. Um, at PTC, you went into leadership because you were less likely to get shot, um, if I'm honest. Um, but you, you, you go into leadership to, to develop, but you have to kind of know what that means. And, you know, part of that development is understanding what mode you're in. So the, four, the very simple four modes of, of leadership around um, tell show observe feedback right so old school stuff right so you you obviously as a leader you're going to tell people what's expected of them and what what you want them to do right you have to be able to show them you know what what that means so whether that be going and running a first meeting going and running a a demo going and running a deal okay uh and then you but but once you've done that you've got to be able to observe them doing it and one of the hardest things, and one of the things I, I, I teach my leaders right now, and, it, it, and always have done, which is really difficult for a, a first-line leader to do, is in that observation mode, is you sometimes got to let the sales guy or the team fail. Because if you step in and save them, they don't really understand and they can't participate in their own rescue. So one of the challenges around, around development, um, and I don't know whether you guys have got kids, is you, you've sometimes got to let your kid fall over and then tell him or her why they fell over, okay, uh, in an observe mode. So in this kind of tell, show, observe feedback, I, I, I see many inexperienced leaders jump in and, and, uh, and, and rescue uh, the, uh, the meeting, the opportunity, whatever it might be. And that doesn't help because you can't scale that because that means you've then got a superhero first-line leader. At PTC, we're all superhero first-line leaders. And uh, again, at BMC, I started to build this kind of real understanding of if I'm going to, if we're going to develop people, we've got to let them fail a little bit. Obviously, we've got to hit the number. But so part of that development then uh, is around uh, skills identification. So when you're observing, you've got to have atomic skills that you're observing upon, upon rather. Um, because you can't just say that wasn't good enough or you weren't very good. Um, going back to football, you know, there's six basic skills. If you don't understand those basic skills, then you, you're never going to make it, right? So, and if you can't communicate those, those things to the, to the sales team or whoever it is you're developing, they're not really going to understand it. So it's got to be very simplistic in it's a skill therefore we can learn it therefore we can assess it therefore you can learn it therefore we can assess it and in that model of that's development development isn't just telling them go and do this go and do that so we talk about recruitment as a process because recruitment is continual and that's a skill which 
all of my readers are very adept at now. Uh, development and per- development on both sides, development, receiving development and delivering development is, is a process. But they, each side needs to know what, what side they're on. So when you walk into a classroom, you're the pupil, the teacher's at the front. When you've got two alpha males, one's who's the, one who's the RD and one who's the sales guy, they're alphas or alpha females. They're alphas, right? They have to realize what mode they're in. So maybe... Um, the leader is in show mode. So the leader's going to run it. The sales guy's going to observe, but in observe, the sales guy's going to make notes and understand, you know, w- w- what, what did they learn? Why did they learn it? What would they do different? And so forth. And if it's the role reversal, the manager's going to be in observe mode. That's a real development culture. And it's really difficult. Wow. To, it's really difficult to um, deploy, especially in companies when you're at an early scale, because we all have, investors and paymasters who want the, who, who want success but if we're going to scale it properly we've got to be able to teach these teach these teams how to do it i was going to ask actually is there a trade-off in terms of ramp up time you know to no. allow for that no it's not because ultimately um ultimately you will get the the the, the factor of remember you, you've got one manager running six that one manager can't be in six meetings, even with Zoom. So you have to entrust the leaders and entrust the staff that they're going to learn. And if they're not going to learn, they're 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 not they're at the they're in the wrong company. That's you know I I, I that's that's a fact. Um, if you don't like reading, then you're not going to come and work in my team. <laughs> what about listening? Audibles. <laughs> You can, uh, the, 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 the challenge, okay, the challenge is you're going to have to write notes and it's better to write notes of a physical book, mm. okay, because we don't learn, we actually learn through what we take ourselves, so you and, si- you and uh, Simon will read the same text and you'll both take different things, but by writing it down, you're going to understand what you really took, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept, okay? Mm. Why, why skills have got to be as simplistic, as simplistic as they can be so that we can, we can repeat them. And, and should I tell you what I've really liked about what you've just said, right? So BMC, you know, we've, we've gone from a, from a situation where, you know, Blade Logic, great success, amazing, you know, some of the most dynamic um, sales leaders all in one place. And then you kind of, reverse takeover of BMC and yet you're still able to kind of influence each other because the things that you're talking about now Andy would have definitely had an influence on some of the others because you can see how they've now adapted their own playbooks to take you know what you're talking about and I think the the, the whole story whilst John McMahon is obviously really crucial I think as individuals the fact you've been able to kind of influence each other and adapt I think that's really kind of helped to continue the perpetual evolution of you as, indiv- you as individuals and helped you guys reach the levels that you have what, what do you think about that Andy yeah uh, look um I'm just thinking before I answer that one. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can't take away the feeling of losing to a competitor. Okay. And it's a feeling of firstly embarrassment. So we, you know, at Blade and, and, and then we brought into BMC and if you weren't embarrassed to lose to a competitor, you weren't going to stay. So irrespective of our recruitment uh, process, right? So immediately we started to bring that competitiveness to each other. And, you know, your, your, your best competitor is an internal guy. You guys are in recruitment, right? You play off recruitment consultants against each other all the time, right? So, that then creates the meritocracy where you're like, okay, I, I, I understand that, you know, even though we're all making a number, I want to make a better number than that guy over there, right? So that that makes everyone stand up a little bit straighter and, and work a little bit harder, right? So that that's probably where I would go with that, right? So the influence around 
you know, some of the charisma of someone like uh, Maro or Thibaut, um, you know, with the grit of, 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 um, of, of, of other guys, of course, there's an influence on each other, but ultimately, I think the the um, the, the real influence was around uh, was around the belief structure around competitors and actually focusing on that. That that's that's a big one, and and obviously that went back to P, PTC, but all the way through that is 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 that that's the real ultimate influence. If you if you want my uh, my input on that. I think, well, competition is actually one of your third pillars of your kind of playbook, right? So I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that and, you know, how you think that's really helped and in what ways. Yeah, sure. Um, we, um, I, I touched on it earlier on. We have, but we, we, a lot of our, I, th I didn't realize at PTC at the time, but a lot of our kind of go to market is around battle cards and, uh, playbooks and, and 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 so forth and and um you know ptc i i went to work for the enemy i was behind enemy lines gathering intel and then when i came over and i don't mean bringing a database i meant bringing the 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 the, the competitive uh differentiations that we could take out of of uh, of that particular competitor and in in, in bmc sorry in um in Essential, we had Informatica. That was our big competitor. And in Blade, it was it was Opsware. And um, you know, and going through the career. So I think um, you get to a company like BMC, and they've got ninety products, and they're like they're, they're they're all over the place. You know, one of the things John did very well is is to try and narrow down where are we going to win. And, you know, that, that, that's a big, big thing. And I see that a lot in organizations where they don't really understand who their competitor is and they just try to pebble dash a market just because they want that success, but it's got to be repeatable. So, yeah, com competition is a, bit, is, is a big one because um, if you haven't got a competitor, you haven't really got a market. And uh, if you don't know how you're going to win or, or why you're losing, I don't know how you're going to get better. So yeah, I, I one of the th reasons I've loved being in software sales from being in football is there's no difference. You know, you 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 ninety percent of the game is done on a whiteboard. Ten percent of the game is how you play the game, and that's exactly what we do. Ninety percent of the game is is power based. Ninety percent of the game is understanding external influences. Ninety percent of the game is understanding how you're going to competitively deposition. 90% of the game is understanding who you, who your enemy's champion is and what's their what's their win and where's their weak points and if I want to go all the way back to PTC you know where do they live and not, not not to knock on their door but where do they live from a geographical standpoint where does your competitor live I'll never forget you know we were doing a deal at Blade and um, we uh, we worked out that um, two things we worked out the Opsware sales guy played tennis with the champion okay we worked that out right we were never going to win however the rd lived nowhere near um the eb so the regional director of Oxware lived nowhere near the eb so we stopped we changed the ground rules we 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 went to the eb and said hey you know why don't we get an executive meeting let's make it seven o'clock on a monday morning and why don't you meet the competitor you know after us and we'll, we'll, you know we'll, we'll align our executive pitches and the EB took it, the RD didn't come. Why not? Because he lived 300 miles away. He couldn't get there for 7.30. So you, you, that's, that, that's, that's a little bit maniacal competitive. And there's stories in PTC of, of, the, of the sales rep in Japan moving into the block of um, the CEO of a big manufacturing company, lived there six months, didn't introduce himself until it was needed six months later and end up with a big deal. So um, this competitive nature, again, it's, it's much more of a, um, of, 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 a, of a wider focus than just, you know, how, how is your product better than the competitor's product? Can you teach that? You can teach the pipeline generation techniques to find that information. You can't teach the character trait 
you know, if you go back to the intelligence, you can teach knowledge, you can't teach emotional intelligence. Um, you can understand coachability. You can't teach character. That's what your parents put in. Or, you know, uh, you, you, you know, the, the persistence and the determination and the, and the, and, and what, what's the chip on the shoulder. You can't do that. That's done it. If you want to go into the real D that's emotional DNA, that's done at 7, 14, 21. You can't do that beyond you're done. You know, that, that chip on your shoulder is already there. So to, 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 to find that motivation inside someone's character and play that and play that competitive nature that you've been outplayed by the competitor, if you get the right team, then you're on the right point, right? And that's what we try to find a lot of PTC by digging into people's backgrounds. So interesting. It's um, for me looking again, looking back at your career, Andy, and, and, and seeing, you know, time and time again, all the way back until, as I said, early stage after PTC, um, essential software being acquired by IBM, played logic being acquired by BMC and signal effects being acquired by Splunk. It's clear that you've got that startup mentality. And what's also really interesting is your ability to then be able to adapt and hang around as well in for that transitional period as well into that larger organization. Um, normally you find that, as I said, the minute the, the startup world ends, as soon as the acquisition happens, it's time for me to hang my boots and move on. What, what, what is it that's enabled you to be able to fit yourselves into both of those environments? Uh, stock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the honest answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, stock. Uh, mm. um, I, okay, I, I guess. Um, mm. you, you build a team and those guys and girls come to work for you. They don't go to work for SignalFX or they don't go to work for Essential Software. Mm. You, they go to work for you as a first line or second line leader. And, you, you know, people don't leave companies, they leave leaders, right? So if you go, if you... you you can have the best company in the world and the, and the shittiest leader and you're going to have a shit company. Okay. So when you build these things and, you know, we use signal effects as an example, that was a fantastic team, but a little bit like PTC, the European team, the signal effects didn't really care about the U S team. In fact, they were their competitors because that's yeah. the mentality that you embed. They want to win and they want to beat both the competitor Data doc and they want to compete they want to be the team in new york okay and that's the culture that you've created and when you've created nurtured developed that culture you can't just bail just because you know that they they they've got families and kids and, and 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 aspirations and it has to be about them right so um you you go to work for them if you make them successful you're going to be successful so just because we get acquired isn't the trigger point for saying I'm not done. See ya. Mm -hmm. um, that happens often because of change of control and, and uh, the big company wants to put their own X, Y, and Z on it. They have paid a billion dollars. They can do what they like, you know? So um, at that point, you, you, you know, the, the team understands that it's out of your control, but ultimately, um, you, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 I can't really, uh, I'm trying not to be poetic here, but it is a little bit like a marriage, you know, you're married to these, this team and they, that their, their needs come before yours. So I, I'm not going to bail just because yeah. I get acquired by company X. If I get asked to leave by company X, which typically is what's going to happen because, you know, they have their own processes and, you know, it happens. Um, the team are going to understand typically the team will bail at that point if they don't get stuck, if they don't get held on retention. But yeah, it, it, it's, um, you know, our goal is to, is to make people very, very successful and then create huge enterprise value along the way. That's, that's the goal. There is, um, there is recruitment as a process. There's, there's maniacal focus on personal development. There's, 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 there's real, real focus on competition. And yeah, we have the six step player book, which we've had for, for years, um, the value framework, but ultimately, um, if you don't make those guys and girls successful, you haven't got a company. Sure. You know, that's, yeah. 
that's the um <clears throat> And it must be quite hard, right? It's, it's like growing a team. It's like growing anything to walk away and, you know, to see that team that you've nurtured and you've got process in place. You've got a good team behind you. Yeah. Hey. You're doing that time and time again. It's like, no. Yeah. Um, absolutely. You know, mm. Benjamin Franklin uh, Brown, that's uh, Brown, <laughs> Green, Green Packs uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, kind of tend to get, get given across uh, the table to try and make that feel less, but you're absolutely right. It's not about money. It's about the thing you've built. Mm. I, I, I'd be lying if I, uh, if I didn't say I wasn't disappointed when we got acquired by Splunk. Right. I'd be lying. Absolutely lying. And, and my whole team, irrespective of how much cash they made, uh, my whole team was disappointed because we were, re- we were really on a, on a great point. Mm. And, you know, you, you lose your runway uh, when that happens. Hey, the investors, that's what we're there for. We're there to build uh, enterprise value. So we did our job, right? Mm. But we, we, we had a great, we had a great uh, thing going in a great run. Uh, and we've got mm. a great thing running in a great run at Imply. It's, it's, it's a show of character there again, though, you know, to be able to do that time and time again and keep re, you know, going through that process, building that team, get the success, get the momentum and then the acquisition happens, then it's okay, on to the next. You know, the energy, is, it, it must be just, as I said, it's just a testimonial to, to, to your character and uh, energy. Yeah, we, um, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, it is. <laughs> we, um, you know, we went, in, in Signal Effects, we went from zero to in the mirror, oh, no, one guy in the mirror, or two guys in the mirror when I joined to uh, 30 or 40 in, um, in four months um, wow. uh, and, and in imply we've gone from one guy in a mirror, two guys in a mirror to 26 right now, I think in, in four months. So incredible. Uh, look, you guys in recruitment, uh, let's go back to recruitment as a process, right? That is ultimately any GM's job or first time leader's job. They recruit their own team. They're over. Get, it doesn't matter whether you've got the great the greatest product in the world. So I, I have the utmost respect for what you guys do because ultimately that's my job for the first six months of apart from I have to then go and develop them and then sell some software along the way. But um, yeah, recruitment is all that I tend to do. And uh, if you if you did go and speak to any of my first line leaders, that that they would. Uh, tell you we we have a forecast call on recruitment every week wow. that's what i mean by recruitment as a process mm. you know in the same way as they might have a forecast call on um on, on deals we have a forecast call on recruitment mm. and you know if they're not hitting their leading indicators on recruitment then they're not going to succeed yeah or if they're not hitting their leading indicators on development they're not going to succeed yeah there's one name that we haven't mentioned which is um you know, which is somebody that you know you've you've been working with for the last two major Signal effects and and now imply Trevor Trevor Patterson. Has he been? You know, is he a big influence? Is it? You know, is it, do you work? Is it? Is it a case that you work really well as a team? What's the yeah Tra- dynamics there? Uh, Travis again. Travis is PTC. Travis is Blade. Mm. Travis is Opsware. So yep. Travis is Travis left Blade Logic uh, after one year and went to Opsware. Okay. Wow. So, you know, he's um, he he literally did do the competitive recce. So <laughs> John John might have opened an office and pretended with business cards. Travis actually worked there, so <laughs> wow. that's a like long game. No, Travis yeah. is a great guy, and um, uh, you, you know the, 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 the what Travis entrusted to me is I just threw a mirror. So I, we yeah he's he's ultimately uh the cro but uh, mm. i just threw him here right he entrusted me to go and build scale and and, and deliver in, in that environment which is which is great because um you you have to if you've been through the tell show observe feedback mode and, you, and you're all good then you've got to entrust the team to go and do what you want them to do right so um the connecting point there though is cranny right you know cranny um cranny was PTC, Cranny was Opsware, Cranny was um, uh, Signal FX, uh, and, 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 and so, you know, that, it was Cranny that kind of brought 
me and uh, me and Travis together. Fantastic. So sorry, Simon, you jump in. No, with I, was, question. I was just going to say, you're obviously doing some um, advisory roles at the moment, right? Um, and I was just thinking about the fact that the trajectory of your whole career, you have always kind of stuck within kind of being paired with people that come from that world. How difficult is it when you are working with, you know, founders or organizations that just don't get your world? You know, how do you work to actually get them aligned to, to buy into this philosophy? Or do you need them to buy into the philosophy for you to be able to kind of work with them? No. Um, I don't know anyone who doesn't have a philosophy of winning. <laughs> Um, you know, there's any, any uh, founders is a great, is a, is a, is a, is a really interesting, uh, you know, topic. And one of the things that between, between, uh, BMC and, um, and, and, and signal, you know, I went and joined a couple of boards in for UK, uh, scale ups. Um, because in my personal playbook, um, what in the command and control model, everyone has a role, okay, and uh, everyone has a boss, and everyone understands what's expected of them, and that scales. I've never uh, understood because I never needed to understand in my uh, in my skill set how to raise money. I've never understood what a VC is. I've never understood, you know, what 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 are the unit economics of a business because I didn't need to understand it in my role. So when I left BMC, that was my goal. My goal was to go and sit on a board, be a CRO, go and understand what drives a business, not what drives a, 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 a kind of a revenue quota in a region. Does that, that make sense? So, yeah, clearly, yeah. In, in understand, so that was my transition to understand what is it about our playbook or my playbook that is relevant to the boardroom and relevant to the VCs and relevant to the stakeholders and how, what is the, the, the language and how do you manage up? Because ultimately, you know, uh, one of the great skills of any sales organization or manager, first, second, third, is the ability to manage up. So what is, and, and, and that skill transcends into, uh, into an organization when you're selling, uh, selling up in an organization. So how do you get above your technical champion? How do you get into the C-suite? What language are you using? So my, my reasons for doing my move into a series, uh, in fact, it was seed series, and we, uh, no, series A, the first one, uh, was to understand that, understand what actually do they want to hear, what language do they talk, you know, what, what, and so forth. So that experience and, 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 and so forth uh, really taught me that what we are doing at the Playbook is very, 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 very relevant, but there is a slight nuance on the language. You, you know, there is obviously... Um, the uh, the real focus not just on ARR but on 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 net retention and gross retention and what does that really mean and and, and so forth uh, and and what does what is the real impact of productivity at, at the board and and how do you scale that from a board standpoint and and take that backwards so that experience which I did for about for four or five years five years I think I did A and then I did seed. Um, and then kind of packed that knowledge and then went back and went, work, went to work for an A16Z company. Uh, gave me, the, I guess, the confidence uh, and the exposure to then go and do the work you're referring to. Uh, and, and that, uh, and, you know, John's got this in buckets, obviously, <laughs> much more than I do, but that ability to take that down and take that up and transcend that message, transcend that message is, is very powerful. Because most founders, remember, they've got an amazing idea. They've got, they're either a fantastic technologist or they've got, they're a great marketeer and they don't really understand how they're going to get that to market. And, and again, I spoke earlier on about adapting, you know, adapting from just having an enterprise sales team to having a flywheel model and an open source model or a, a you know, a, a, um, a freemium model. You know, I've adapted, I've had to adapt over time, right? Uh, because B2B enterprise sales teams are absolutely needed at a certain point in time, but that may not be right for that particular organization at, at, at that moment. And, uh, 
that's been an, 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 an you've had to I've had to adapt as well to that theory and, and process and understand how to do that. Incredible. Yeah. Question that we would oh, is always a, an interesting one to ask is that if we were to speak to any of your employees, how would they describe you as a as a manager, as a, as a person, and a person and as a manager? Uh, focused. Right. Um, because, because in my life and professional career, everything has been, which is why I picked up uh, an assignment at the start of this, it has been around. A structure everybody understands where they sit and where they are right so like I don't mean where they are organizationally I meant where they are in terms of development and 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 um, one of the kind of evolutions I think most of the people who went through PTC understand is we were in a fear culture at PTC fear mm. nothing else fear Fearful of losing our job, fearful of, of not closing the deal. Fear, it was a fear culture. And the problem, an opportunity of a fear culture is, number one, it weeds out the people who can't handle the pressure. But also it means they, um, that they're fearful of, 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 of coming up with ideas. Okay, They tend to look down and just do their job. Okay, So one of the things I try to change in, in, in the culture of my leadership style and my leaders is to, is, to, is to have an expectation culture, not a fear culture, but an expectation culture which is built on a foundation of it's okay to fail as long as you know why you failed, okay? Now, having that safety enables people to go, hey, I, I, I don't really understand how to do this. Could you help me? Yeah. Now, at PTC, you get shot for that question right okay you should know the answer to the question because we taught you that on new hire you i need to speak to your manager <laughs> uh so that that environment is 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 key and you know a lot of the uh people you you're speaking to in this in this uh podcast understand that and create mm -hmm. environments which which have a, a, a have safety built into them as well Okay, so it's okay to fail as long as you know why you're failing and you're brave enough to say, hey, I need help. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, so that, that, that therefore leads to, I hope what people would say is that um, I have conviction in what I say and, deliver, and, and therefore have their development interests at heart. 100%. That, 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 that's, I think, what they would say. I think it's really clear from everything that you in, in the way in which you've spoken about all the answers and what we've talked about is that you show a tremendous amount of care. You care about people, you care about the success and you know, that's, that shows. And I think it's a, it's, it's a lovely you know, point, especially when you reflect it back into, you know, bringing up children, you know, that ability to be able to see them make that mistake, see them fall over, but be there to observe and rescue at the right time. And I think that is just... Yeah, let's, okay, that sounded very poetic, right? Listen. <laughs> I'm not a very poetic person, so I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> All right, I mean, yeah. You still be, like, mm. take people out into the car park and shoot them in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's pretty real, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, but that is less and less and less, okay? So, uh, and, and typically, if you've recruited right, that's not going to happen. Mm. Okay, so... That's why it's recruitment as a process. If you've recruited wrong, you end up in the situation where you're in the you're in the a bad situation with a guy, right, or a girl. So mm. um, if you've recruited right, and 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 that's been a mutual recruitment process where they've they've qualified you and you've qualified them properly, you shouldn't be in that scenario. Okay. So I I I, I like the poetic ending uh, the, the the statement you made then, mm. but it's still very high Tough. intense yeah. you need to be high expectation mm. sales right it's not it's not uh i i do understand people have a private life and they want to you know and 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 that shouldn't come at the forfeit of their job right mm. that, that is probably changed over time that i agree with mm. but the expectation that we're still going to win that hasn't changed mm. that hasn't changed one bit 
So uh, uh, one of the questions that we always try to uh, ask on this show also is just tell us a little bit about the, uh, you know, some downtime. Do you, do you obviously you must work hard, um, but do you, do you get some Andy time as well? Is there, you know, is, what, what do you do in your spare time? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I've got two kids, right? So uh, uh, that, You're a taxi driver. <laughs> uh, you're not wrong. My, uh, my, my, I've never pressurized my kids to do anything because I, I was pressurized to be a footballer, but my son wants to be a footballer now. So he's actually, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's uh, uh, playing for Charlton Athletic Football Club right now. So, um, wow. yeah, so he, he's a young boy. He's only four, uh, 13. So uh, he, uh, I tried not to, but yeah, now I'm in that zone. I mean, I, you know, now he, he wants to do it he's going to do it properly and, and he's, and he's doing well. So, um, that's part of it. Uh, and, uh, I've started to get fit because, uh, the problem is you ignore yourself and then so I've started to get fit, which uh, has been an interesting exercise, but look, I, I, I'd be really interested to the answer to the rest of my, uh, my cohort on this podcast, what they say, there isn't a lot of downtime. I, I, when you've got a family and you're building something, if you've got downtime, there's something not working out. So uh, there isn't a lot of downtime. Apart from Mauro, he rides cars. <laughs> he rides cars. And it's, it's, somehow he manages to do the NASCAR and enter into I, I don't know about that. I, I, can't, I can't see it. I'm sure Tebow's got loads of downtime right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I don't know. I, I cycle, I, I, I work out, I, 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 th there isn't a lot of downtime, you know, uh, especially now without the um, traveling. When we travel, we get a bit of downtime because we're in a hotel and we can, you know, we have some time there, right? But right now, <laughs> there's zero downtime because of, uh, of COVID because we are literally back to back. A and especially in a company at our, sc our scale and size, right? We are right on the point of, as you pointed out before i've done it a few times i we're, we're right in the point of uh, inflection right now so we are deep in personal development to work out command of the message wow brilliant we've got to get that right we've got to get it right so, so i think oh go on simon the, the, the say, fi final the, yeah the final question um so we we always ask this question andy um does the does the hunter make the unicorn um in your opinion as in just the salesperson and the sales leadership make the billion dollar valuation company is it possible uh the buyer makes the unicorn okay but to get to the unicorn valuation and I, i'm obviously i'm not allowed to tell you what the signal effects multiplier was right but it was very 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 high therefore it comes back to com for competition okay if you've if you've got a competitor and you're absolutely smashing the the livelihood out of that competitor and 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 accelerating at an amazing speed that's going to attract attention which creates a market which creates a billion dollars to do that you've got to have an amazing uh, go to market motion which you know you've referred to in b2b sales right so let's work back from what we're trying to do right so yes this is absolutely what's going to drive it but that market if you're in the wrong market you're never going to get a billion dollar valuation. Okay. So that's about the intelligence to pick the right market. Um, if there's no competitor and you're not, you're not hammering the competitor, then you're probably not in the right market. So um, yeah, I, I, I think that's a long answer to yes, but. Yeah, no, perfect. So um, as a, as a as kind of a closing statement to summarize what we've heard today, right? I think, uh, when we interviewed John McMahon, one of the things that he said to us was be a student of the game. Yeah. Okay. That was one of his big, big mantras. And, you know, one of his closing statements was be a student of the game. And I think when we look at you, Andy, where you kind of came from, you know, playing professional uh, football, playing professional soccer, as you did, um, you know, making your way through the ranks it's evident that the reason why you've been able to evolve the way that you have is because you wanted to study the game. And you mentioned the acronym OPM, you know, learn from other people's mistakes. Um, and you've been able to adapt. 
Um, and at no point did you ever kind of dwell in the comfort of knowing everything. You've always had a thirst to kind of improve. And I think that really underpins the three pillars of your playbook, which are, you know, recruitment as a process, um, invest in development, um, but don't do it how it's always been done. Always find the new ways, always evolve, always bring, you know, new ideas to, to ensure that you can adapt and be relevant to where you need to be to be able to ultimately beat your competition. And to beat your competition, you need to know your competition, you need to study your competition. And I think, um, you know, I, I think that's a, it, it's definitely been a, uh, a fantastic um, you know, interview today. We've really, really enjoyed having you on the show. Um, Want to say kind of a really big thank you for you taking the time to speak with us. Um, and I'm sure our listeners have taken and our viewers have taken a lot from today. So I want to say a, a really big thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much, Andy. Really appreciate your time, mate. Yes, thanks, Alan.